Hello and welcome. You're watching To The Point. One of the most interesting and intriguing politicians in Pakistan is the country's former World Cup cricket winning captain and now a major opposition leader, Imran Khan. In 2011-12, when he was leading million man marches, he was thought to be the future of Pakistan's democracy. In 2013, many thought he would sweep the elections. In 2014, some thought he could even bring down the government. None of that happened. But Imran Khan remains very popular with Pakistan's young population and also with its urban citizens. Today, even though many believe his political fortunes could be sliding, they could easily quickly reverse and rise once again. Presently on a visit to India, Imran Khan is my guest tonight. Imran Khan, you come to India 48 hours after the two countries have announced a new comprehensive bilateral dialogue starting presumably in a month or two's time. And this follows secret talks in Bangkok between the two NSAs. As leader of, the Pakistan, of Pakistan's second most important party in voter share terms, how do you view this development? I think very positive. Both sides of the border um, should welcome it because, uh, you know, one thing we need in the subcontinent is peace between the two neighbors. And uh, with peace follows everything else, trade, prosperity, and above all, reduction in poverty. So um, it was quite uh, disconcerting for us when in the beginning uh, this sort of standoff took place. So now uh, things are looking good. So you welcome this development? Absolutely. You support it entirely? Absolutely. I've always, uh, like uh, I think majority of Pakistanis, we've always supported that the peace process should move forward, we should settle our disputes, and, and then trade should open up. I'll tell you why I asked this question, because today Shireen Mazari, who's perhaps one of your closest advisors in foreign affairs, has in fairly strong terms criticized this accord. She's asked for an explanation from the Prime Minister for why he signed it. He, she's asked for explanations about why Pakistan's interest in Kashmir is not given the same degree of attention as India's interest in terror, why assurances have been given to India about the Mumbai attacks, but nothing received about Samjhota. So she is very critical. No, yeah, she's not. What she, well, first of all, there are Shirin's views as well. I mean, Shirin is an expert in foreign policy. But isn't but she me, your advisor? She, she is my spokesperson in, in information, but she's not on foreign policy. She's not an advisor on foreign policy. But let me just make it clear. Uh, she might criticize aspects of the talk, but no one criticizes the fact that the dialogue should resume and talk should resume. Okay, then let me put it like this. Recently, you said that what was holding up India-Pakistan relations was the fact that the two prime ministers were not showing leadership. Now, after this decision, do you believe they've shown leadership or do you still have reservations? Uh, well, let me qualify that. <clears throat> what do I mean by a leader? The, one of the greatest examples is Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela's greatness was that he rose above the fact that 27 years he spent in jail discrimination, apartheid, and he rose above for the future of South Africa and got the uh, different communities together, which we thought that they would, everyone thought there would be bloodshed there. And it's a statesman who thought of uh, the bigger goal. Now, for me, Pakistan and India, the, what the leadership has to do is to talk about what is best for the future of the subcontinent. The best is peace. Why peace? Uh, and resolving our differences and having peace because it is the best way to reduce poverty in the subcontinent. Peace. Because it's trade and everyone knows the benefits of trade. So therefore, uh, when I say leadership, they lack leadership. I got the feeling that, um, you know, why have secret talks in Kathmandu? I'm, I'm talking about, I commented on Barkha Dutt's book where she said there were, uh, there were secret talks and she indicated that perhaps Nawaz Shri was worried about Pakistan's establishment. Neither government has confirmed that, but it, there is no reason to dispute it either. But one reason why secret talks happen, whether it's in Kathmandu or in Bangkok more recently, is because A, it's away, away from the glare of the press, and B, it allows governments to reach an understanding without being tripped up by press coverage or opposition criticism. For instance, Shireen Mazari's criticism could certainly deflect Nawaz Sharif if others were to join what she's saying. You are applauding what he's done, but if more people like her start criticizing Nawaz, he could have second thoughts. That's why they do it in secret. It, it, kind of two different things. Number one, um, I, when I talk about leadership, you have secret talks. 
But in that specific uh, uh, comment, w w or, or the, the, in the, what she had said, uh, Barka Dath, she mentioned that um, uh, perhaps uh, Narendra Modi was worried about his own uh, constituency, right-wing constituency, and Nawaz was worried about the establishment. My point is that leaders do not worry about these things. They get uh, inspire people on board towards the greater vision, and the vision is peace in the subcontinent to, uh, to, to uh, eradicate poverty. Then let me ask you this. How do you view Narendra Modi today? Do you believe that he's serious and sincere about trying to resolve the problems with Pakistan? Do you believe he can seriously improve the relationship? Do you think he has it? To be honest with you, you know, I thought that just like Mr. Vajpayee, uh, he represented BJP. We were all scared when he came into power. In Pakistan, we thought, you know, uh, it would, uh, the distance between the two countries would increase. But in fact, Mr. Vajpayee reached out to Pakistan. He paid a visit there. And everyone took everyone by surprise and actually started the peace process. Does Mr. Modi have the same capacity so, in your eyes? So uh, I, I was a bit disappointed. In the beginning, I thought that uh, Narendra Modi, Prime Minister, had this huge majority. And this was a great time to be a statesman. And from position he was in, it was to get the countries together. I thought there was, uh, you know, I was a bit disappointed. But people change, they learn. Do you think he's changing? Do you think he's learning? Well, I think this is a positive move because for a while we thought the distances wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't get closer. I mean, we thought we would just grow further apart. But there has, I mean, this uh, movement in the last few weeks, yes, it gives us hope. I know that you're hoping to meet him later this evening, shortly after this interview. What will you say to him in the context of the step he's taken with Nawaz Sharif? Uh, I mean, broadly speaking, I don't know what I'll say to him, but mainly that, you know, the future of the subcontinent lies in peace between the two countries. That's it. So let's resolve our differences because the dividends of peace are enormous. Let me put it like this. The joint statement issued on Wednesday just 48 hours ago separates terror, which is India's main concern, and the way it's treated from all the other subjects. Terror will be discussed by the NSAs, but Kashmir which is Pakistan's principal concern, has been packaged with all the other subjects to be handled by the foreign secretaries. How do you, as one of Pakistan's most important opposition leaders, view this differentiation in treatment? I think that uh, even if you put it in a different package, you cannot take away the importance of Kashmir because that really is the sticking point. Uh, as we say, it's the core issue. Sooner or later, it has to be resolved. And, you know, if you read, uh, well, our uh, ex-foreign minister, Khurshid Kusuri's book. I mean, in that book, he just spells out how close they came. I mean, how close the peace, pro uh, the, 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 the process of resolving the Kash Kashmir issue, how close we came. So, except, except, why go to Kusuri? Ufa, this July, failed to mention Kashmir. Ashraf Ghazi, one of your more distinguished Pakistan High Commissioners in India, said that was a goof up, it was a disaster. And Nawaz Sharif was left embarrassed, Sardar Aziz was literally twisting in the wind at press conferences to try to explain it. This time, when Kashmir is being treated differentially to terror, could that create a problem in Pakistan? It's clearly not going to create a problem in India, but could it create a problem in your country? Would someone like you, for instance, seek to embarrass Nawaz on that? It's not, look, I don't want to embarrass Nawaz or anyone when it comes to talks with India and getting closer, decreasing hostilities. I mean, any sensible person w would, uh, would want things to be peaceful in Pakistan because what we've been through in the last 10 years, uh, you know, the country has been through hell. So your position so, is this is so, not an issue to make a point over? Uh, not to make a point over, but at the same time, unless Kashmir is resolved, I'm afraid we will never have lasting peace. And therefore, I come back to the point, leaders are those who have a vision, a much, much larger vision, and they mobilize public opinion to, towards that vision. So in my opinion, the dividends of peace are so enormous that any hurdles in the way, like Kashmir, which is, a main issue, which, which is the main issue, they have to be resolved. And from Khurshid Kusuri's book, and of course, Shah Mahmood Qureshi was with me, 
the, the, the talks were in a very advanced stage about Kashmir. Well, but just, so just, 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 just on that, I should point out for the sake of the audience that Kasuri's view about how close things came is not necessarily the view of Indians who worked closely on that subject, but leave that aside. <laughs> yeah, Le but let me ask you, know, you this. Again, here, let again, me ask you this. Not You're everyone saying, wants to divulge what happened because these were obviously back channel talks. But let me put it like this. You're saying Kashmir, from your point of view, is the main issue. I want to ask you, how do you, as an opposition leader in Pakistan, view Kashmir? Is it the core issue as Nawaz Shri sees it? Or do you believe it's one of many issues, but not the core one? No, it is. Uh, the moment Kashmir issue is solved, Karan, I can tell you that everything else will fall into place. Because everyone will understand the benefits of trade. Look, there's China on one side, there's a China economic... Uh, uh, corridor to to Gwadar, this this the, this link now, the opportunities are so huge for both India for Pakistan, so it would be madness to be held hostage to an issue which can be solved. So in your eyes, Kashmir is the core issue, which is the key yes. problem. Yes, it is. Then, as a politician who hopes one day to be Prime Minister, what do you think is the best way the two countries should handle this issue? Because after all, it has been developed relations right from 47 till today. Uh, well, confidence building measures. You start first, uh, you know, decreasing the tensions. And then how? Uh, for a start, stop the rhetoric. You know, this, this uh, uh, you know, the rhetoric of which, which was going on in the past six months you know, blaming each other for terror, Pakistan blaming India for terror in Balochistan, and tribal area in Karachi, India blaming Pakistan for terror whenever anything happens here. So therefore, understanding, you know, terrorism problem for both the countries. Pakistan is the biggest sufferer. So get together and resolve this issue. And by the way, things have really moved fast in Pakistan from, for, for the past one year. Which things are you talking about? Uh, dealing with terror. But that's only Pakistan Taliban. You're talking about Zarbe Azb. The terror that's not tackled, as far as India's concerned, is the terror that the LET and Jaish unleash on this country. I know that in the joint statement, Pakistan has promised to take effective steps on the Mumbai case, but Zakir Rahman Lakhmi is on bail. No attempt has been made to rearrest him. The cases are languishing. They've been carrying on for eight years. The judge has changed six or seven times. The courts have changed two or three times. So, you know, that key issue hangs in the air unresolved. Karan, let me, let me just again say that since one year things have changed. How? First time all the political parties came uh, together in all parties conference. They passed what everyone endorsed what was called the National Action Plan. First time in the history of Pakistan uh, all the parties resolved that all armed militias will be disarmed in Pakistan. First time. It's never happened before. And it's led to Zarbi Azab. No, 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 impact not just... is on Waziristan and Pakistan Taliban. There's no impact on LET, Jaish and those inflicting terror on India. No. That's the key issue no. that Mr. Modi keeps raising. No, but Karen, let me again repeat. Zarbi Azab had already started when this, or this uh, army public school incident happened and all the parties came together. It had started six months earlier, Zarbi Azab. This, uh, this national action plan specifically said that no armed militias will be allowed to operate in Pakistan. Pakistan would not be allowed, Pakistani soil will not be allowed for any uh, terrorism outside the country. So all the parties resolved, every party signed this document. And since then, there's not, there's not just been action, Zerbi has gone, gone on, but in Karachi there's been an action now. Militants, Karachi is a much more peaceful city. Um, and then the sectarian groups have been targeted. But LED hasn't been two terror attacks this year. I'm talking about Gurdaspur and Udhampur. A Pakistani terrorist actually captured by the Indian forces in one of them. Hafiz Saeed continues a free man. I know that now Pakistan television no longer shows Israelis live. But there's a 10 million bounty on his head by, by, put by the United States. From time to time he issues blood curdling threats against India. He remains free. So when you talk mm. about steps that can be taken, I ask you again, if on that terror issue they aren't, Will we ever get close to each other? Well, uh, Karan, again, I repeat, look, I can only say that this is a document which has been signed, endorsed by all the parties and the army military leadership. We were all, the army chief and the entire political party spectrum was there. And all of us signed this document uh, uh, for the first time, disarming all militias 
That, in, militias. that includes LET. Every every armed militia. It's a document signed by the, all, all the political Except parties. Except action against LET is still to be taken. Well, they, you know, there are other uh, still militant groups roaming around in Pakistan, but they, you know, gradually would action you, is being taken. Would Imran so, Khan support action <coughs> against Hafiz Saeed, arresting uh, him, detaining him, ensuring that he doesn't come up with these periodic Karan, threats against India? Karan, don't put me on the spot about any militant group because, listen, you know, life is difficult in Pakistan. You can't just, uh, it's very easy to sit in Delhi and, could, you know, make statements. But actually in Pakistan, I've been one of the, uh, the Ministry of Interior issued this thing. I was on the top three hit list. So I'm not going to talk about militant groups. I'm just giving a statement that as far as the Pakistan uh, po political spectrum is concerned, the government, the army, all were on board that we, there should be no armed militias in Pakistan. And so, you know, it, steps are being taken. The army at the moment is very popular simply because, for the first time, there's an across-the-board clampdown on terrorism. Let me then ask you this. You're confident the steps have been taken. You're saying to me that after domestic terrorists tackled, LET will be tackled. Give Pakistan and the army time and space to do it. Do you believe that what began in Bangkok, what reached some sort of hopeful outcome in Islamabad just two days ago can actually lead to a genuine change in the atmosphere and relationship? Or is this just a hope which, like many previous hopes, will remain unfulfilled? Uh, again, a lot depends on the leadership, but this is a good beginning. And I do believe, uh, you know, that the moment people realize, and that's why people-to-people -people contact is important, that's why test series is important, cricket ties There's are There's a third thing that's important, and I'm coming back to it, not just the leadership, not just people-to-people -people contact, but also the leadership needs support from its opposition. It's not just Shireen Mazari who's criticized this joint statement, Fazlur Rahman has done so. And there are others that are being cited in your papers today, unfortunately here in India, so you don't know, but they've been doing it. Would you, when you go back, say to them, because they're opposition leaders like you, look, give it a chance. Uh, Don't criticize before anything's even happened. Uh, but, Karan, listen, I mean, opposition is meant to criticize, but no one is discouraging the talks. I mean, opposition, the whole idea of an opposition is to keep the government on its toes. And so, but the opposition is not against talks, even Fazal Rahman. And let me tell you about Fazal Rahman. He is a coalition partner of the government, of Nawaz Sharif's government. But, you know, it's not just the opposition in Pakistan. The opposition in India has been accusing Mr. Modi of betrayal. They can't understand why Mr. Modi has changed his position between Ufar and now. And so you talk about the need for leadership to stand tall, but opposition in both countries is doing identical things, which is to try and cut the ground from under any initiatives the Prime Ministers take. Uh, look, uh, Karan, I'm here. I had the, you know, uh, from... Uh, the voting point of view, the second biggest party in Pakistan. Uh, I'm here and talking about peace, dialogue, talks, moving forward. There will always be hiccups. But my point is that when I talk about leadership, leadership always shows the bigger picture. Look, Karan, let me complete this. Leadership shows the bigger picture. The bigger picture in the subcontinent is the dividends of peace. Now, if if a leadership in Pakistan and India, and it can only happen when both of them are on the same page, if they can, if they can tell, show the picture, the dream of open borders between India and Pakistan after having resolving our differences, the, the, the benefits of trade, the impact on poverty, I'm, I, I can tell you that they will carry everyone with them. No opposition will be able to stand up to this there's, that dream. There, there's no doubt that the vision you're sketching out as a vision is beguiling, and a lot of it hinges on what you call the benefits of trade. You've even talked about how trade needs to be, in fact, the factor that boosts the relationship because it creates common dependence and therefore fosters common trust. And the like problem, it, none the like problem, it. Imran Khan, is that in fact your country is the slow one on trade. You are reluctant to give India most favored nation status, even something reduced, like non-discriminatory market access, which was promised for December last year, hasn't happened. It's Pakistan's reluctance that holds back the trade relationship. Karan, it's, this is not true because Pakistan has a completely different point of view. If you speak to the Pakistani traders, they say they're all these uh, uh, red tapism and all the hurdles on the way of free trade. So, I mean, but look, all this can be resolved. Point is, if we can all come, first of all, can people of Pakistan and India come to a common vision that, look, the benefits of, of, of trade, of peace, 
far outweigh any other hurdles in the way. So we can then remove all the roadblocks. But it has to be a common vision. Unfortunately, uh, we do not have the leadership which stumbles on the way, this gets stuck at a roadblock. They are not focused. The reason why people succeed is because they are focused on that vision. Then can I ask you a last question on this subject before I switch and talk to you about Pakistan's internal politics? When you meet Mr. Modi later this evening, will you say to him, regardless of the fact that I'm an opposition politician and my job in Pakistan is to criticize the government and check them, nonetheless on this issue, I support my government and I support you and I wish you good luck. Will you say uh, that? Uh, but Karan, I have been coming to India what, as a politician for 15 years. I have never changed my stance. I've, I have always believed long before I actually even came to politics. When I used to be playing cricket here, I still always thought that the only option was peace between the two countries. And will you say the same thing in similar tones when you go back to Nawaz Sharif? I'm your opposition leader. Shireen Mazari, my spokesperson, may have criticized you. But on the question of making peace and following a sensible policy with India, I support you. Yes, Karan, I will. You mean it? Of course. In that case, let's take a break at that point, Imran Khan. When I come back, I want to turn and talk to you about Pakistan politics, the role that you're playing, and the belief that many have that perhaps your fortunes there are sliding rather than rising. We'll be back in a moment's time. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching To The Point and an exclusive interview with Pakistan's opposition leader, former World Cup winning cricket captain Imran Khan. Then let's turn at this point to your internal role in Pakistan and the politics that you play in that country. Last year in the company of Tahir ul Qadri, you together staged a dharna that lasted four months. At the time you said that in fact it wouldn't stop until Nawaz Sharif left office. And you paralyzed Islamabad right through that duration. But a year later, Nawaz Sharif is still in office. He's done exceptionally well in the local body elections recently. Your party, in contrast, has done rather poorly, if not disappointingly. <laughs> what did that dharna achieve for you? Uh, firstly, let me tell you, in local government elections, always the sitting government wins. So we, our sitting government won in Pakhtunkhwa. Except that you were on record saying you were going to sweep the local body elections. And even in Punjab, which is your home state, you've <laughs> lost badly to Nawaz Sharif. I have never said, I said we'd sweep the, nat uh, the national elections never the local government elections. In fact, no one has ever won the local government elections if you're, not in, if, you, if you're in power. No one has beaten the sitting government. We won in KPK, People's Party won in, in Sindh, uh, MQM won in Karachi, Nawaz Sharif won in Punjab. So, and Nawaz Sharif, uh, let me say PMLN, in 2008, when the elections took place, all the local government uh, uh, district presidents belonged to, Nazans belonged to, Q League, but PMLN won the national election. So, Come First back to the dharna. But what did the dharna achieve for you? What, the question is, why did we do the dharna? The dharna was because in 2013, 22 political parties said, whether they won or lost, said that the election was rigged. Only one political party said that there should be investigation into that rigging. That was PTI. So Can I interrupt and point out that you came up with the stand that the elections were rigged one year after the elections were over for the first one year? You're on record saying the elections were free fair? No, absolutely not. Well, Your own papers record you saying uh, it. Uh, 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 no, Karan. It was only in 2014, a year later, you decided it was rigged. 2013, the day the elections finished, three days later from the hospital bed, I give a statement. I said the election is rigged. Just opened four constituencies. There were 413 con petitions uh, with the election commission. I said just open four as a sample, and if those are clean, we'll accept the elections. But if they are rigged, if the four, if you find rigging, then what we want is an investigation so that 2018 elections would be free and fair. You got the investigation. You no. insisted on a judicial commission. Eventually, the government agreed. They set up a commission to go into the charge. You defined that a systematic and designed conspiracy had happened. And you know what the judicial commission concluded? They may have criticized the election commission, but they did not support in any way your claim of a conspiracy. That was a setback for you. Let, let, let me give you the facts. What happened was... It These are the facts. No, no, no. no I'm giving you the facts. The facts were that after, uh, for one year, we tried the Supreme Court, the Election Commission, the Election Tribunals, the Parliament, for opening these four constituencies, out of 413. After that, uh, a year later, we staged our first demonstration, and then we still asked them to open the four. 
When we did not get justice, I told them if we do not get justice, it's my democratic right to have a peaceful protest. And that's when we And you that did. Now. It lasted so, four so months. You demanded then, a judicial commission. So, you got so, it. But the commission so, found not in your favor. Uh, uh, Karen, let me just tell you exactly what happened in the judicial commission. Uh, the judicial commission came up with this. There were two TORs. One was that was the systematic rigging. Of course, we were not going to be able to prove it because the JC was supposed to have a GIT, a joint investigation unit in which they had ISI, MI, they could have invited but, anyone. Oh, no, no, but let, if let, you say, let, of let course, me, we couldn't prove let it, just, let why me, make a charge let, you can't prove? Let me, let me just say that. How can, when the, all the agencies are under the government, how can an opposition party prove it? Remember, 22 parties, the winners and the losers said the election was rigged. Now, but the you J asked for the judicial commission. No, 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 exactly. Now, the JC, what it should have done was, it, had, it could have got any of the government agencies to work under it to prove the rigging. They didn't do it. But so you're it, saying no, the no. JC didn't do its job properly? Mm -hmm. It they, was headed they, by they the sitting it, chief justice? They left it incomplete. But what they did prove... Were you saying that incompetent? Were they partial? No, when you no. say they left it incomplete, they what does it mean? They left it incomplete because they should have gone all the way. But let me just well, well, Why didn't they? Because the sitting chief justice headed it. Are you saying that he was partial? Uh, I'm, what I'm saying is, in fact, the JC itself said that the consequences of the decision were so huge that they had to be careful. No, but what, I'll tell you what, what oh, they proved. Careful of what? Were they or the result. So, but no, no, but... You're, you're Karen, suggesting as if A, the chief justice who headed the JC was... No, Marshall? I'm not suggesting Secondly, anything. Secondly, you're suggesting I'm, that they I'm, were under pressure Karen, from someone. Karen, I'm not suggesting anything. Let me just tell you the facts, what happened. What emerged was that 25 million ballots were missing. That came out. That was proved in the 40, 40 observations of the JC. One was that 35% of Form 15, which means the ballots that are not used, which should be accounted for, 25 million ballots were missing. Our lawyer, after that, stopped arguing the case. He thought we'd won the case because what the two TORs were, one was systematic rigging, one was, were the elections lawful? So as far as our lawyer was concerned, when 25 million ballots are missing, the election is not lawful. So what you're so, saying no, no, to no, me is that uh, the Judicial me, Commission uh, has been me, incompetent. Let, let me, the JC, what they said was, the election was largely lawful. That wasn't the TOR. It was either lawful or unlawful. L largely lawful is a very dangerous statement to make, meaning it could be 35% unlawful. But do you know so what you're saying? Do you know what you're saying? Just pause a moment. You're talking of a judicial commission headed by the sitting chief justice of the time. You're suggesting it was incomplete, which suggests it was incompetent. You're suggesting that it wasn't allowed because it was being cautious, therefore it was under pressure. You're suggesting that your lawyer either misunderstood what he was doing or got fooled by something that he believed they were going no, to do. I, You're casting huge aspersions I, 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 on the Judicial Commission and the then Chief Justice. I, what I'm saying is exactly what I'm saying. Number one, the election, the JC should have gone on because once they discovered that 35% of Form 15, which is 25 million ballots were missing, they should have gone and probed it further. Our lawyer thought that he had proved his case and he stopped. By the way, we was, he, did, was your lawyer incompetent? No, he was a brilliant lawyer. Uh, uh, Hafiz, the, the what do you mean he thought legend. he had proved his case and because then he stopped that clearly? He made a misjudgment. No, uh, Karan, listen, when 25 million ballots are missing, think about it, in India, would you consider an election lawful? No, you wouldn't. So then you're saying so, that the Judicial Commission came up with an incompetent, no, wrong result. I, you're I'm, blaming the Judicial Commission. I accept it. I, before the Judicial Commission sat, we said we will accept whatever, uh, whatever verdict they came up with. You're not at the moment so we, accepting no, no, it at all. We accepted the verdict, but this is my criticism. I have a right. You can criticize the verdict. I am giving you criticism that yes, and I said, by the way, I did this after the, after the verdict. I gave a press conference. I said, because we had said we would accept it, I have accepted the verdict. But here is the problem. In which society, in which, uh, for instance, in a Western democracy, can you say uh, an election is largely lawful? You can't. It's okay. lawful or no? unlawful. You know, it, this is not the only time that you're questioning the verdict of a commission which you actually said in advance you would accept. There's so, but also, no, there's but we also the paradox. Okay. We accepted it. We accepted it and criticized it. But that's my so right. Severely criticized but it as you are. Karen, that's my right. But, but the paradox is you did much the same thing when your internal party's election tribunal headed by Justice Wajihuddin Ahmed inquired into your inter-party elections and found them to be fraudulent. He said that the post should be in fact dissolved, that the election should be re-held.
You dismissed that entirely. In fact, you went one step further. You replaced Wajuddin Ahmed with another panel under Tasneem Nurani. No. So there again, <laughs> instead of standing by what your own commission no. appointed Correct. by you had said about your own elections, you turned a no. deliberate blind that's eye not to what it. Happened. That's not what happened. Look, first time in Pakistan's history, a political party holds intra-party elections, okay? And because it was the first time, we made a lot of mistakes. And so one after the election, a lot of petitions, we set up Justice Vajudid as an election tribunal to decide on the elections. So Justice Vajudin came up with a uh, uh, lot of queries and eventually decided that there were so many mistakes that you have to hold re-elections. And that report and that decision you refused to accept? It's the current, please listen. And then you replaced him. No, but please listen. We accepted the verdict. We decided to hold re-elections. He then empowered me to perform an ad hoc because he dissolved all the positions. So I said, okay, do you, wh when we prepare for the next elections, because we don't want to make the mistakes of the previous elections, we set up an election tribunal commission. Now, election tribunal was Justice Bajuddin. He gave his verdict that the elections were annulled. We then decided to hold re-elections. We removed all the, we uh, put an ad hoc. We put Justice uh, uh, Tasneem Nurani as the head of the election commission. And remove Vajuddin in the process. No, because Vajuddin had done his job. The, he passed a judgment on the election and I'll done, his job, them. done his job or annoyed you by the way he did it no. and the conclusion he came to? Because that's what your press suggested. No, 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 no. That was, we thought he overstepped his bound. He started uh -huh. taking... You do agree. You think he overstepped his bound. You said no, so. No, look. The JC in Pakistan was formed. It was to pass a judgment on the elections, 2013. They passed a verdict and the, uh, the JC finished. He passed a verdict and so the tribunal finished. So we formed an election commission and now the election commission is ready to hold the next and it's our party. So election. when people turn around and say that in fact your own internal election tribunal gave a verdict that you found unacceptable and therefore you responded vengefully by removing him it's and dismissing his verdict, current, they are wrong. Not true. The election commission annulled the elections, we accepted it, okay. we formed an ad hoc, formed an election commission and now we're going into another election. Let me then come back to the dharna because in a sense what people call your sliding fortunes begins with the dharna. People say the outcome of the dharna was in fact to weaken the civilian government, to strengthen the role and influence of the army, Nawaz Sharif lost, Raheel Sharif gained, civilian democracy in Pakistan suffered. How do you respond to that criticism it's, of your dharna? It's like saying that 20 million Britons came out against the Iraq war and they were somehow to weaken Britain's democracy of Tony Blair. Look, peace But Raheel Sharif is stronger today no, and Nawaz is weaker. That's undeniable. But, but tell me, Karan, it has nothing to do with me. I was for one year telling them, there are so many recordings of me saying, look, look, is that unreasonable to say? Just open four samples out of four 13 petitions. Just open them four. If you find that this election is not rigged, Fine, we accept the election. But if it is rigged, just do an investigation so 2018 election is free and fair. Tell me, what is wrong with that? No. Prima facie, nothing. Well, but you know, well, but they, you know but what people said current, in your country? People person. in your country said it's that not in fact people in my the current. dharna is inspired by the ISI. A belief that they thought was corroborated by the fact that you kept talking about a third empire. Uh, and they thought the third empire was the army. They current whatever they might think. People say you were the cat's paw for the army and then the army let you down instead current, of helping you. Tell me one thing. Here's someone struggling for 18 years in politics. Would he want the army to come in? I mean, would I want martial law to come in? Hold on. They said I mean, that would was I the only that? way you could remove Nawaz Sharif who'd beaten it, you in 2013. It's, it's well, Why don't you look at it the other way? 22 political parties, including Nawaz Sharif, say that the election is rigged. Should there not have been an investigation? They all, they all clamped down on the... They said, no, no, fine, it's rigged. Let the election commission investigate. Election commission rigged the election with PMLN. So, so the, listen, listen. So, so all the I'm saying is, is Pakistan, it, was my, were... it was my right as a Democrat, when the, everyone is saying the election is rigged, there should have been an investigation. The only way was a judicial commission because the election commission was involved in the rigging. So the belief, so the belief in Pakistan that Imran Khan was acting as the cat's paw of the it army, wasn't that this was part of an attempt by the ISI to do what they call a soft coup, weaken Karan, the civilian government, Karan. strengthen the army, and that, by the way, is the outcome. Nawaz is Karan, weaker, Rahim me. Sharif is stronger. It was the biggest democratic movement, that dharna that took place in Pakistan. 
anyone who said things like is bringing the army in, they don't understand democracy. Because these, these be unfortunately, we have these family political parties that behave like kings. They don't understand criticism. They don't understand that in a democracy, if the elections are rigged and everyone is saying they're rigged, the winners and the losers, it's my right to have investigation into the rigging and not by the election commission because it was involved, a judicial commission. So if they had, if they had formed the judicial commission immediately, I wouldn't have done the dharna. Because they didn't, after one but year, it's the outcome after of, one year. But it's the outcome of the dharna I'm talking about. My fault. Your political fortunes haven't improved. Uh, the civilian government has now come under the control of the military. Democracy in Pakistan has suffered. Raheel Sharif is so much stronger. And the elected prime minister that much weaker. It's uh, that Karan, outcome, it's people say, what you, that you this, may not have intended, but this, you've provoked. Karan, this thesis is absolutely wrong. And I'll tell you why. Number one, this has been instigated by... Uh, the status quo, all the status quo parties who don't want to change, who don't want to change in the election system. L listen, listen. Anyone who opposes and criticizes this election wants reforms, they call them anti democratic. Uh, number okay. two, Raheel Sharif, if he's got strong, it's not because of the dharna, it's because he, of Zerbeazm which has become very popular. It's because he's gone after terrorists across the board in Karachi operation. That's what's bring, got him uh, popularity. It's not, because, it's not because of the dharna. That, I mean, how can the dharna weaken the uh, prime minister? Let me end by briefly I mean, broadening. Would let me Tony end. Blair be uh, let, affected by people came out in the streets let me to demonstrate what is their right? Let me end this interview by briefly broadening our discussion. As I said in the introduction, in 2011-12, when we were holding million man marches, you were thought to be the future of democracy in Pakistan. In 2013, you believed you would sweep, you even said so to the Guardian. Hmm? In 2014, many thought you would overthrow the government. None of that happened. In I fact, didn't want to fact, overthrow the government. In fact, I didn't want in 2013, to overthrow the government. You did very poorly. Why would I want to overthrow the government? In 2013, because the, to bring in the army? In 2013, what, what am I struggling you for? did badly. In 2015, in the local body polls, you've done badly again. Not in Are KPK, you sliding not down in our here? province. We but in, in Punjab, province. which but is your home, in Sindh, where you hope to Karen, do well, in you Pakistan, even allied with the Jamaat Islami, they've got you nothing history, in the city. Kar, Pakistan's history never has anyone won against a sitting government in a local government. Never. It's I, never happened. The, because the because we do not have an independent election commission. They control the election commission. We don't have free and fair elections. So look, look, let me just say one thing. PTI, my party, is more popular now than ever before. It is the biggest party in Pakistan. The SDPI... You mean that? More popular the, today than ever before? The SDPI survey about a month back puts PTI at 32 percent, PMLN at 27 percent. We are the number one party. And trust me, there were similar it is the surveys before the 2013 elections, no, which gave no, you confidence to believe you. No, no, no. You said no. so to the Guardian. You did yes. Nowhere in you the survey. Heard. You no, came third. You Nowhere in the survey did they put PTI number one. Never. Now they have. PTI is the most popular party in Pakistan. It's in the only federal party. It's in all four provinces. And and the dharna. It created awareness. It was the most democratic movement in Pakistan. It told people about their rights, the farmers, the laborers, and, I, and nothing, nothing can stop PTI in the next election. In other words, you're saying in 2018, you will win the elections? And that's why we want an independent election no, no, commission. No, no, hang on a second, hang on a second. Yes, yes, we will. Provided will the election commission is independent. I tell you the problem with saying, yes, yes, nothing can stop PTI. You said the same thing in 2013 yes, and you didn't win. Yes, but we didn't win. realize it would be the most rigged election in our history. Where the winners, are, 22 parties said election was rigged. So in, 22 two, in parties, two years from... Every party said election was rigged. So roughly in two and a half years from today, in 2018, when the next actual elections happen, Imran Khan will win and be Prime Minister? Inshallah. Yes. Well, inshallah means it's in God's hands and that's how let Everything out. is in God's hands, but for God's sake. I mean, everything happens with the will of God. But, uh, uh, just looking at the way the party is going... But you really growing, do expect to be Prime Minister in 2018? I think uh, Tariq and Saab will sweep. They'll sweep simply because they're all the other tries, uh, parties have been tried and tested. And I'm just giving you a mm -hmm. statistic. It's our first time in power. NKPK, first time, they've just come up with the growth rate. P, uh, 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 KPK, despite the ravages of terrorism, today heads the growth rate at five percent, which is more than any other province. And just just crime in KPK has come down sixty percent. Remember, it's surrounded by the tri tribal area, three sides. So we will prove by our governance in KPK, it is the best. It, all polls show it's the best governed province now. 
we will show by performance. We're right out of time, but I'm going to get you to repeat that critical answer because it will be so important for audiences, not just in India, but in Pakistan, your own country. You're saying to me in 2018, your party will sweep. Uh, it will win. Uh, it will sweep, inshallah, in all provinces. Win or sweep? Uh, sweep. And you will be Prime Minister of Pakistan? Well, I, I hope so. <laughs> Imran Khan, a pleasure talking to you. My pleasure.